is interesting because I normally have whatever. All right, <clears throat> so we got lots to talk about today. Alt seasons getting started. So I have uh, I, to make something clear. I've, I haven't announced that alt season is underway a bunch of times. I think alt season got started. I think back on the seventh it was a little over a week ago when uh, when Ethereum sold off. I mean Ethereum. Right here, this this event right here, that was the third. That big spike, that was it. So it was way back on the third. So on the third, if we look here, I think Bitcoin had a little bit of a sell-off. Yes. So Bitcoin had a little bit of a sell-off right through here. Where my mouse is. And uh, Ether, that same day, had a huge pump. That was the beginning of alt season. That's the inversion event. So that's when funds started moving from Bitcoin to other projects and it started starts with Ethereum. Ethereum is kind of our gauge for that. So this event right here was the beginning of alt season and then obviously Ethereum has been and it's just the beginning. Alt season is about a three month thing so just uh, keep that in mind. So we're at the early 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 stages. Every time I show this chart of my take profit zone way up here this is like three months out. Right? So we're not talking about um, it's not going to spike up there in a day. There's going to be a whole bunch of moves and trades all along here to get to get there but that's my ultimate take profit zone all right so I, th I do think alt season is getting going here we see plenty of signs of the early phases of it bitcoin dominance chart is breaking down as we would expect now we still haven't broken down we have the support we're coming into and remember alt season doesn't have to be a as big as last time or be a, even a thing right it doesn't even have to be a thing this is what we anticipate might happen and we're taking trades as they present themselves but if alt season's a bust alt season's a bust this is why all my base funds are in bitcoin because if i'm wrong i'm wrong and i take trade setups whether they're there use good risk management and so far i'm i'm well in profit in this early phase and if it ends up being a bust then i'll just exit with a little bit of profit on these these little bit of spikes that we've had uh, let's look at eth e for um we had a question open the the session Isen van had a question about should i buy eth e now uh and sell some stuff or should i wait for next week so here's what you have to ask yourself you know, eth e the the i think our obviously our premium collapse which actually happened right through here this is the day that eth was up big and and ethereum and that's the day that uh, grayscale dumped a bunch of uh, a bunch of um locked up uh, ETH e shares were were available in the market, and they got dumped on the market the same day ETH was up. Obviously, our our um, uh, premium compression has we've we've compressed our premium, so the premium collapse is over, and now we're going to be following ETH. Now, here's the thing: ETH e will probably outperform ETH. If ETH were to make a leg up, ETH e will make a bigger leg up because the premium is going to expand again as those shares get sorted out. I'm take a sip of my cold brew here. As the, the shares on the market, the, the, that extra liquidity that got dumped on the market gets gets sorted out, right? Um, the premium will expand again. So you have to ask yourself: Is does ETH look bullish, or does Ethereum look bullish or bearish? And whatever else you're holding, is that a better trade than Ethereum? Fundamentally, like if you're holding equities of some type or anything else, is that a better trade than Ethereum? And I'll give you my my initial price target let's just start with my start with a, a bang right here what's my initial price target now I've said many times this early part of what I expect to be our um, the early phase whenever we kind of drop we fall out of support here and maybe come into like the 50 area or somewhere in this range for to find support on the Bitcoin dominance chart that move should coincide with a move from Ethereum from where we're at to roughly 3,000. My my ultimate target for this spring, the next three months, I think Ethereum is going to hit $3,000 in the next three months. Now, if you can tell me another instrument that's going to 3x in three months, I don't think Bitcoin's going to. I think Bitcoin might, might at most double. But I think Ethereum's going to outperform Bitcoin, right? I think Ethereum's probably going to 3x from here. If you can find a trade that you think is going to 3x or better from here on out, then stay in it don't go to ETH e if you an ETH e will well, probably if Ethereum 3x is ETH e is going to 4x so if if you know you think about the trades that you're looking at if the trade you're looking at has a has a, a better opportunity to, to 4x over you know 400% gain over three months then stick with it if not this is this is maybe a better trade for you to look at this is not financial advice all right so let's start with my, my usual I keep forgetting I have my notes here 
Okay, so um, let's start with my opening notes. This channel, thank you everybody for joining the live stream. Appreciate you all being with me today. So this channel is a CTM community channel. This is a community channel. I take feedback from all over the community, our, our Conquering the Markets community, and I distill that down and give you my thoughts on what's going on. And it's a very CTM trade methodology focused channel. And what I'm here to do is try to help uh, navigate new people who are new to crypto or new to trading crypto uh, through the waters of a little bit about the tech and the trading setups and so forth. Again, this is geared for new traders. Now, the disclaimer is I am not a financial advisor. I know that's shocking, but I'm not a financial advisor. So this is education only. And also, if you take any trades that I recommend, you're going to lose a thousand percent and you're going to end up living in a van down by the river. Okay? So just know that. Because I'm an idiot. I don't know what I'm talking about. All right, moving on. Um, what I wanted to talk about today is let's focus on Ethereum. And I'm going to wrap up this session with some Ethereum technology. We're going to talk about what smart contracts are. I want to give you guys just like a two minute, what is the Ethereum virtual machine? So I think if you understand what the virtual machine is in relation to what smart contracts are, you'll be able to understand the ecosystem a lot more. But let's start with, uh, let's start with the price action from the past week and we'll start with Bitcoin. And we're going to do Q&A as we go. So I'm going to pause right here. I'm going to take a look and see if I've got any really good questions um, that I'm going to answer. And then we'll get into to price action for this week. But let me go take a look at the comments here. Um, and now on, on Twitter, I uh, will show you my Twitter. If you're not following me on Twitter, by the way, that's a good segue. Um, consider following me on Twitter because Twitter is where I post all of my, my public charts, any ideas that I have. And again, I'm not a financial advisor, so don't think that I'm uh, trying to give you financial advice. But I'm just sharing the charts that I have. And I post a lot of like alerts. Like this morning, I posted that I thought uh, BTC was going to get a bounce at 13... 13 what was it? What did I say? 460 or something? Right there? 13, 4, 13, uh, 34.6? And sure enough, it bounced at 34.6. Now we're coming back into that. I also thought we'd be range bound in this area for a while. I think we're going to be ping pong in between 34.6 and 36.5 as we consolidate here. As uh, institutions are going to put a floor in here. I mean, you can see the algos are buying pretty aggressively as soon as we got down below here. Push price right back up. Um, I think institutions are probably going to put a floor under here as, as algos get aggressive about buying. Um, and we're going to be range bound here. Now we could wick down, especially overnight. Nighttime weird stuff happens. And as we leave the New York session here in a little bit, um, that's where we get some more weird price action. So a wick down on Bitcoin to like this this uh, trend line is is totally um, something that could happen very quickly. Um, but I would imagine a probably pretty quick recovery given this this pattern that we're watching here on Bitcoin. This kind of wedge pattern. Um, and so I put this kind of stair step, kind of my thought process about how the higher lows might look. Now, obviously, we, we could get a wick down, but that would still be a nice higher low. Now, obviously, you got this, this little bit of low down here. So hopefully we hold a higher low than that. But nonetheless, we'll continue to do something like that, most likely, and march our way up as we ping pong around in this wedge until we break out. I've got a breakout, you know, tentatively later this month, 23rd, 24th, 25th, somewhere in there, um, looks like. But, you know, we can break at any time. I, I'm, I'm not a Bitcoin overlord. It's just what I see on the charts here. All right, questions. Let's go to questions. If ETH doesn't take off Tuesday onward, I'll hold stocks. Oh, you promoted me on Jordan's channel? Hold, thank you. Um, can I play Led Zeppelin? <laughs> I, can, I can look at Led Zeppelin. That sounds awesome. Uh, Doja, thanks. Will I be okay staying? Yes, you'll be fine staying in Bitcoin. If you want to be totally safe, just hodl your Bitcoin until the end, and and you'll make you'll you'll do well. Thank you for the suggestion. Hit the like button. What's up, everybody? BTC USD chart looking painful today. Oh, Henry, come on now, come on now. We were we were just at eleven thousand. What was this right here? Oh, t a couple months ago, we were at ten thousand dollars. <laughs> come on. This is this is great. This is good price action. We're getting a nice way. We're getting consolidation. It, you know, institutions are accumulating. Everything big big players are accumulating. That's what we want. That's what'll put push price back up as supply evaporates. Liquidity, liquidity evaporates, and then price has to surge upward and look looking for sellers. So now I think it's fine. Um, I have ETH, but should I start taking off early next week? Is today's price good one to enter uh let's see what we got on ethereum let's just look at ethereum right 
I mean, Ethereum's got the same basic pattern going on that Bitcoin does. Um, Ethereum's a little bit more bullish, and here's why. Um, Ethereum, w the resistance we're into is super duper light resistance. Like we've we've come we've nicely consolidated into this very light resistance, and then the all time high is above that. Bitcoin's broken its all time high, and Bitcoin's up in in price discovery territory, but. Ethereum is fighting with the last little bit of resistance before it goes into price discovery. So likely, think about this. What's going to happen when, when Ethereum finishes consolidating here, makes its next leg up? It may not hold the all-time high, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to break the all-time high like Bitcoin did down here, right? It's going to break it and then fall back below it for just a little bit, right? Or make, make some headlines and then off it can go. So when ethereum breaks this little bit of resistance it's in right now this 1226 which is not much resistance it's just nicely consolidating below that it's gonna it's gonna print a new all-time high it's gonna make headlines and then as that head as those headlines get circulated that's when the fomo really starts and that's when a move like this move can happen so yeah i think ethereum looks Look at this. It's like so close to its prior time high, unless something really bad happens and it gets really, really bearish, which I highly doubt given the move we've had. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't see us making some big, strong legs up at any moment. Like literally, as I'm talking, it could happen. It could be the weekend. Could be next week. Could be late January, early February. But it's gonna, it's gonna surge upward here pretty soon. All right, that's my opinion. You know. Um, are you familiar with QETH, the same premium as ETH E? Um, I am vaguely familiar with it. I don't, I don't keep track of these trusts very, very closely. I just loosely keep track of them because they're not, they're not my primary trading instrument. I just happen to buy them in, in equities accounts, or I, I, I can't directly buy the crypto. So um, I'm not primarily tracking trusts or anything. Thoughts on Monero? Thoughts on Monero? That's a good one to look at. Let's go find it. It's on my list somewhere. XRM Monero. Oh man, it's gotten beat down over here, huh? Um, you know, Monero's got the whole privacy use case thing, but with regulation, putting it under pressure here. Uh, uh, the charts tell me not to buy. The charts tell me that it's under pressure and just to leave it alone for now, right? Well, wait. When the charts, you know, when we break back above this like downtrend, this long-term downtrend that we're in, we might start looking at it. But as of right now, price action tells me stay away. That's all I got for you. The, the protocol can be interesting, but you know if the price action is terrible, then it, it doesn't really matter. Um, so move ETH move is imminent. Yes, I definitely say so. You know, look at my Twitter. Let's go back to my Twitter feed here. All the things I post. Um, going live. So I posted about this head and shoulders. Potentially I posted that several times. I did post. XRP looking over its shoulder as as polka dot was surging up there. It's nice. Lemmy's chart. I did post somewhere in here. I did post. A, yeah, here we go. January 9th. All the all the little spikes started to happen. Um, I did. So yeah, I posted something about a move being imminent. I, th I don't know if you're referring to my twi tweet or not. Spell imminent. I can't find it. It's not on my thing. Anyway. All right, moving on. So you think that lower $14 is a good price to enter ETH then? We're already in the FOMO phase or still in rotation? Uh, that's a good question. I would say we're in the rotation phase still. Um, and the reason is you see that Bitcoin is consolidating here, and we've had big spikes on like Link and Dot. So... And remember, I think people have this weird impression that it's everything pumps at the same time in alt season, and that's not the case. Like different projects will spike at different times, but they'll find they'll spike, they'll make a leg up, they'll they'll consolidate uh, at a, at a new you know a new high of some type, right? They'll be making new all time highs and then consolidating, and then another project spikes over here and it makes a new all time high and consolidates another one, and, it, and they ping pong around. It, it doesn't. It's it's not like literally every single altcoin jumps fifty percent. At the same time, now people who are watching the USD charts—that's where the impress people get that impression from—is that if you're watching the USD charts, whatever you know, like the bigger ones, like Ethereum or Bitcoin, make a move, then alts typically follow. So alts will follow. Everything follows Bitcoin in, in the crypto space, but 
Um, a lot of alts do track Ethereum pretty well too, um, especially if they're tied to Ethereum. So as Ethereum makes moves, they're all going to make moves. So on the USD charts, it looks like they're all spiking, but on the BTC charts, you see a very different story. They're all independently getting bids as different hype comes out. And that's alt season. Alt season's when you can have this monster leg up, like, let's go to the USD charts, right? These big spikes up, consolidation, next leg up, consolidation, that's alt season. And they don't all necessarily pop at the same time. They all pop at different times. So, something to keep in mind. Um, but yeah, we're, we're definitely, we, we, I think we're still in the rotation phase and, and we're, this is really as, in this cycle, it looks to me like instead of Bitcoin having a significant sell-off, it's going to be Bitcoin consolidating and altcoins taking their turns at making a run. And they'll probably all follow as soon as ETH on the USD chart here kind of does its breakout thing. As soon as imitation is flattery, what do we got here? Somebody's posted. Um, as soon as ETH... I don't know what that was about. As soon as ETH makes its its next leg up here, you're gonna have a lot of altcoins kind of follow. Um, but you know, you get the, the bigger players. Ada's made some spikes up, right? The big leg up. Lynx now made a big leg up. Dots made a big leg up. So this is alt season. This is the early part. Still rotation. When Bitcoin breaks this wedge, that's when the FOMO starts. So um, as Bitcoin consolidates here, and if Ethereum Ethereum uh, makes some moves, hold on a second, guys. Okay, my camera frees up. Looks like my camera froze up. I've been having problems with my camera. Let's kill the camera. Okay. All right. Um, but yeah, as as Ethereum makes its next move here, that's you know, uh, that's when okay, all coins are going to fall. What I was going to say is Bitcoin. As Bitcoin consolidates. It, yeah, alts are going to start to pop, and so that's going to get people really fomoing about alts as, as headlines make it. Links making a new uh, all-time high, and did it make a new? Yeah, it made a new all-time high, right? Today, and dot is making new all-time highs. Um, or so as these things make new, at least you know recent highs. Oh, I don't have a chart that goes back that far, but um, as as these things make new highs, the next time Bitcoin finally breaks out, the alts are likely to run. You know, if we look at what happened last cycle, the alts will will move ahead of Bitcoin. They'll move bigger than Bitcoin on the next leg up potentially. So we'll have to see. But this is during this consolidation is what I call that rotation phase, right? And that's what we're in. We see lots and lots of big spikes of different altcoins happening. Um, and then when Bitcoin breaks out and breaks, like say, forty two thousand, if the altcoins go ballistic and run ahead of Bitcoin, that's the FOMO phase. Now, it doesn't have to be the same. Bitcoin could be so strong because of all this institutional buying that altcoins simply just maybe tread water at best, and they're not really good trades at that point. Um, uh, and, and so it would still be a FOMO phase, but, but it would be a Bitcoin-centric FOMO phase, not a crypto market FOMO phase. So we'll just see what happens. Uh, just take trades as they, as they present themselves, and that'll be that. Uh, van down the river sounds nice. Could you do an ETH versus ADA? Like, what's the main difference? Yeah. I mean, I can tell you right now what the main difference. You know what, Philip? I will weave that in at the end here in a minute. Um, we're going to be going over Ethereum smart contracts, the Ethereum virtual machine, and sidechain scaling. And I will explain why Cardano, you know, has a lot of these elements that Ethereum's working on already built in. Fundamentally, um, Cardano is Ethereum 2.0 delivered before Ethereum 2.0. I mean, it's really that simple. So Cardano is going to be way ahead in delivering a similar scalable solution. Um, and actually, when you look at what Cardano has done with their, um, um, uh, what's it called? Validation rigor, the, uh, the, what's the, anyway, all the validation that they've done, the, um, the words escaping me, um, that, What's the word? Anyway, um, all the effort they put into proving that their solution is going to work, it's a more provable solution than even Ethereum 2.0. Sharding is less proven than the technology that Cardano is using. Let's just put it that way. Um, 
can you please paste your Twitter link on this page, please? Yeah. It's a Crypto Jedi with the zero for, there it is, zero for crypto and one for Jedi. All right. Back to the, back to the talking points here. Um, are DOT and ADA competitors? Um, no. Yes and no. But no. Are we in the FOMO phase, the rotation? You're not moving. Okay, yeah, I killed the camera. Um, how can Biden's speech impact? Could have, I haven't heard Biden's speech, and I don't really care. Is technical analysis of altcoin and BTC pairs as reliable as technical analysis of altcoins and USD, since there must be fewer looking at the charts? Um, Tony, uh, I, I think analyzing both has merits. However, um, because my goal is to okay the trade right now is bitcoin ethereum cardano link dot as interesting as they are the reason the market is going up is because of the bitcoin having cycle first of all right the supply cut supply and demand the other half of it is bitcoin is is the gold 2.0 trade right it's the it's the heads against the macro situation going on in the world with all the uh central banks printing like in, crazy to try to keep their uh, economies afloat so it's the trade for two two reasons. One is the Bitcoin halving cycle, and two, it's the gold 2.0. So this is also why I, I've said several times, I think people are going to be disappointed by altcoin season. I think they're going to be holding alts, expecting them to 100x or 1000x, and they're going to like 20x. Um, so that's why I'm, so I am trading them on the Bitcoin chart because what I care about, the metric I'm measuring them against is are they gaining, are they appreciating value versus Bitcoin? If they're not, I might as well not be in altcoins, right? Because Bitcoin is the trade. So that's, that's why I focus on, and I have been successfully trading the Bitcoin chart. So um, yes, I think if you use good CTM methodologies, you can successfully trade these because we're not trading on like super low, you know, people make this assumption, oh, because it's a low liquidity market, not a lot of people are watching it, you can't trade it. Well, yeah, you can't day trade it maybe, you can't scalp it as easily as it wicks around like crazy. It's a lot harder to scalp on a really, really low time frame because it's very illiquid. But but that's the trap of trying to trade a really low time frame. Uh, on a longer time frame CTM methodology, uh, we're, we're following market trends and waves in the market. So yes, I think using CTM methodologies with an eight or 12 hour time frame and waiting for, you know, not trying to pick bottoms or tops, but waiting for, you know, a clear um, um, sign that, that the market's moving a certain direction, you can trade these alts versus Bitcoin. And I, I've been doing, I'm, you know, I'm up 30% since January 1st. <laughs> since, since I moved my funds over to Kraken and started trading alts, I'm up 30% on the Bitcoin that I moved over to Kraken. And I've only had a few, you know, a handful of little trades in here. Um, and so, and I'm using, I'm just following CTM methodology, you know, just following it how you should follow it. And, you know, just being patient, setting, but another thing I'm doing is I'm setting wider than usual stop losses. Um, so I'm setting really wide stop losses to help me prevent from being wicked out. And I think I've got a pretty good system dialed in there. Like I posted a trade earlier on DOT, for example. Notice where I placed the stop loss. I didn't place it below this wick here or these wicks here. I placed the stop loss way down here at 31. I gave it to the next support level and then some. Because my assumption, <coughs> my contention is that if we get a sell off of that magnitude, then we're going to have lost momentum. And we're going to be going lower and I'll be able to re-enter a trade down here, right? But if it's going to resume up here, I want to be in the trade because my take profit target is way up here. Five, six, you know, one, seven, eight. That's a huge, you know, that right there is what, a three to one or four to one? I didn't do the exact math on it, but it's probably at least what, a three to one or something. Um, so, you know, that's a good three to one trade that I'm trying to take advantage of. And if we, and I still think it's probably going to be bullish, but if we, if I get stopped out, then I will, momentum's going to carry it further down. That's, that's where I place these stops a lot of times on, with, with, especially the crypto market. I give it a lot of space, and I know that if it hits my stop loss, momentum's going to carry it down, and I'm going to have an entry either at or below my prior stop, most likely. All right. So that's my thoughts on trading. But I, I think longer time frames will save you. I think you can do, I think you can trade... Um, versus Bitcoin in longer time frames following the, the waves in the market. All right, 99% of coins will fall, fail in 10 years. How do we identify the ones that won't fail? Well, um, first of all, 
you look at the major projects and you look at what the market's most interested in. For example, if everybody could ask me about Litecoin, I haven't traded Litecoin, I haven't bought Litecoin since last cycle. I, mean, I, haven't, I haven't bought any Litecoin since like 2017. And the reason is, I don't think it has a future. Like I know it's a big name project, people keep wanting to to try to ride, but it's not gonna it's not gonna go anywhere, guys. This is not going anywhere. Like, there is no future in Litecoin. Litecoin has no future. It, like the being able to like wrap to Bitcoin, and as soon as Cardano comes out, being able to move move the equivalent of wrap Bitcoin, the Cardano equivalent of of, of uh, ERC twenty tokens, on a very very you know agile block you know chain with very low fees or the lightning network there's just no future for litecoin or dash or zcash it's just there's a million other ways to do that stuff using using bitcoin as the base and so you know i just so yeah i mean uh and then you know things like xrp i've never i've never owned xrp i've never once bought a single token not one because it's centralized it's not a decentralized protocol on that topic let me let me go on a soapbox here and this is what I want to talk about with Ethereum. Let's talk, let's talk a little bit about Ethereum tech. Let's get back to Ethereum. When we look at market potential, okay, so there's two things to look at. What is, is, is the cryptocurrency you're looking at a disruptor to an existing incumbent market? And if so, what is the uh, market potential of that project if it were to be successful in disrupting the market? A good example of that is Theta. I keep, everybody keeps asking me about Theta. And I think Theta is neat. I think... A decentralized version of YouTube is cool, but a decentralized version of YouTube built on a blockchain, I just, I'm not sold on that. And the reason is the way blockchains work. It's an immutable ledger of, of transactions. And I don't care. I care about decentralized governance with like a, a video sh streaming or sharing service. I don't care that, like nobody cares if like, you know, you go change, if, I wanna be able to change my videos. Like if I think that, I was just really wrong about something and I want to go delete a video because I was really wrong about it or change my notes, you know, of my video or change something about my video or edit it after the fact. I want to be able to do that. And with a blockchain, you, that that information is locked in and so it's it's a it's an amendment to a previously locked it's a very inefficient way of doing like video storage. So, um and so, I mean, that is not necessarily built on a blockchain, but the concept is I, I'm cool with like decentralized versions of these things, but you don't need a crypto asset or a blockchain to to facilitate that. That can just be an open source community project, right? Like open source has been around forever. Apache, Linux, come on, like, this stuff has been around forever. So, and a decentralized open source version of YouTube, cool. On a blockchain, I don't really care. I don't care about the, the, the token relates. I don't really care. <laughs> like. I can I can I can use other cryptocurrencies to do transactions on a decentralized um, open source version of YouTube. Like I, I, we can we can use Ether or Bitcoin or something else to pay for transaction fees on that network. So that is not that interesting to me. Now there's like Filecoin. Like the the way that blockchain works is super highly inefficient. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about what is Ethereum. Let's just start with that. What is Ethereum? Ethereum is, so Bitcoin is, in, com in comparison to Bitcoin, Bitcoin's a very simple design. It is an immutable, means you can't change transactions in the past. It tracks uh, unspent transaction outputs, securely hashes these blocks, so forth and so on. So the result is a, a ledger of, of account balances, okay? So it's a very secure ledger of account balances over time. What Ethereum is, it doesn't ha it doesn't record unspent transaction outputs. The way the Ethereum protocol works, there's something called the Ethereum virtual machine, and it's basically I'm going to use simpler terminology than, than it really is. It's like a, a sandboxed application running on a computer is all it is, right? It's just a little piece of code. Um, it's it's a it's a a, a runtime set of code that runs as needed, and it's sandboxed so where it can't affect you know it can't. Uh, uh, this, you know, what you're doing in that sandbox is you're running unverified code. These smart contracts are unverified code, so you don't want, you know, issues with unverified code to be uh, exposed to the underlying system. So it's just a little sandbox that runs on, on a machine. Now, the Ethereum mainnet network, the virtual machine is spread across the world. So everybody who's participating in the mainnet network has the same virtual machine. So basically, Ethereum is a really terrible computer. It is, it is using what takes one computer is doing that 
10,000 times, right? So every computer on the mainnet has to do the same validation of, of contracts. So what contracts are is they're code, and contracts send these things called op codes to the virtual machine. So the, the virtual machine doesn't actually run you know, a smart contract. It actually has received commands from the smart contract via these things called op codes. And how you know you get when you want to run a smart contract and all a smart contract is is a one-way application it's an immutable application but it's what's called turing complete which turing complete means you can do things like looping and you can basically calculate anything you want now you've all heard of gas fees how the ethereum let me go back to ethereum's chart while i talk about all this how ethereum put on a low time frame so y'all can sit and watch it bounce around how ethereum um prevents people from, you know, denial of service attack, you know, just putting like very complex uh, contracts together that, that loop and crash everybody's Ethereum virtual machine is you have to pay every every type of transaction. There's different types of transactions require a gas fee. You have to pay for that computation to be done on the network. And so if you want a computational element, it costs so much. If you require storage, it costs more. So there's all these different ways that we calculate gas fees. And so you know, if you have a very complex contract that's, that's going to eat up a lot of compute resources across the entire network, you've got to pay a lot of gas fees, or it requires a lot of storage, you've got to pay a lot of gas fees. And that's the, that's the equalizer to make sure nobody's abusing the system. But it's extremely inefficient. So literally, everybody's computer, thousands of computers around the world are having to run the same exact computational element and store the same, comp, store the same storage element uh, for Ethereum to work. And it's great because it's decentralized and we can all agree and there's a good consensus algorithm through the proof of work algorithm that we all agree that these computations, the hashed result of these computations is correct. And so um, the other difference between Ethereum and Bitcoin is Bitcoin is a very simple unspent transaction outputs are the output that so you've got inputs and outputs, right? And in, in every in every block of a, of a bit of Bitcoin, and what what's ultimately recorded is the unspent transaction outputs associated with wallets involved in that, in those transactions, and those are all chained together. Well, Ethereum is basically the result of the computational elements, and so uh, wallet balances are just a computational element, basically, and that gets hashed onto the blockchain, and 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 so then that gets that's stacked over time as well. So, but. Ethereum obviously has the advantage of being able to run Turing complete programs. So you can run anything you want. And the equalizer is the gas fee to make sure you don't abuse that. So with that, all that said, because it's horribly inefficient, we've got 10,000 computers set. This is an example. I don't really know how many full nodes there are on the Ethereum network. But 10,000 computers around the world running the same exact code over and over and over and over and over again. It's, it's incredibly inefficient. Now, what if we could, instead of having 10,000 computers all do the same thing, what if we could pull in that computational power and spread up that work across 10,000 computers? Now, instead of having it being restrictive, you can have an amplifier, right? You can amplify the capabilities of the network, right? So if all 10,000 computers were independently validating different transactions, that you would have 10,000 times the transaction output, 10,000 times you know, the computational power and storage and everything else. But that would be that would require a central orchestrator to orchestrate 10,000 computers. So then that goes back to being a centralized, and there are, there are protocols and programs that do this, that, that uh, amplify the compute power by, by using a little bit of compute power across a bunch of nodes to, to increase, to, to have a very strong computational capability. So what Ethereum 2.0 and sharding basically is, is going to do is split up the, a 10,000 node network into 10 1,000 node networks. So now we've got 10 times the transactional power. Or, but it, and it's still decentralized because you still have 100 unique, unique ele, you know, um, um, elements. And so you still have some decentralization. Or you could, go, you could go further out, right? You could have more shards, more computational power as the network grows, so forth and so on. So that's expanding the power, and it, but it's a trade-off about the, you know, of, this, of centralization versus decentralization. So whenever, whenever Ethereum 2.0 comes out, it's in theory um, going to be less decentralized. Now, in practice, it will be just as, if not more decentralized, actually, honestly. But, but in theory, it will be less. But they're also making a lot of other improvements along the way to make sure that that's, that's equalized. So back to the point. So that, that's just Ethereum super simply explained. Um, where I was going with this is 
back to your Cardano question, Cardano has the ability to do what's called sidechain. So there's Cardano mainnet and there's all these sidechains. So we can increase the computational power of the network by, by asking a subset of nodes to do some computation on the side in a side chain and then rolling that back into the main chain. Once that computation is done, hashed, agreed upon by that side chain, we can roll that back into the to the to the main net. So it's a different way of scaling. It's not a central orchestrator orchestrating a bunch of, of more hard for you know hard shards of the network. It's um, the network sending computational tasks or tasks to a side chain to be done. And this gets back to um, market potential. Now, looking at projects that could really blow up in the second phase of, in the, in the second half of the altcoin season. Now, I'm going to get back to some questions. So I, I'm going to pause there. I have more thoughts about um, projects we can look at to take advantage of the realities of Ethereum scale issues and sidechain scaling solutions related to Ethereum. Um, but I'm going to look at some comments here just before I get, I, I get back to that. What about XLM? XLM is great. Uh, I like XLM. Um, XLM is like the people's version of, you know, Bitcoin's the people's money versus the US dollar, which is like for rich folks. Um, XRP was for rich folks. XLM is, is the people's version of XRP. So I think it's great. So where is XLM? What's XLM's price doing? I don't even know where it's at on my chart. Let me look at it real fast. I got it at the very top. Look at that. I had the very top. Um, yeah, I think XLM's great. I mean, it didn't have the same market potential some of these other projects do. I will talk about that another time. But um, never XRP, always XLM. That was my that was my thesis the whole time. Um, do you think ETH will outperform GBTC during this bull run in crypto? Yes. Simple as that. Um, they say ETH is too slow and overambitious. What do you say from a merely technical perspective, not ideological perspective? Um, ETH is just fine. ETH, ETH reinvented the, the with with the way that that uh, um, you know the the virtual machine works and gas fees to normalize the ability to do smart contracts on a on a decentralized blockchain. Basically, um, uh, Vitalik and um, Gavin Wood reinvented. You know, and they, they developed a whole new category of of project. So. Uh, I think Ethereum's fantastic. They wanted to get that out there as quickly as possible and figure out the scaling on the back end, which is what I mean. Any, you know, people dog them for that. That's what that's what Facebook did. That's what Google did. That's what Amazon did. That's what Tesla did. That's what SpaceX does. They just they they're very ambitious and they're gonna build something that works and then they'll figure out you know if, if there's problems they'll figure it out as they go right. But they have a very ambitious goal. They go for it, you know, full on. And I don't, I don't fault people for doing that because that's how innovation and disruption happens. You can't sit there and, and overthink things and be just, just sitting on your laurels and whatever, right? So uh, ETH was very ambitious, um, and they're, they've got the network effect now. Now they've got a really tall task to uh, be able to scale up before these other competitors start to steal market from them, namely, you know, Cardano and then the EOS and a bunch of others too that are out there that that are that are good. Pro well, not EOS. EOS is dead. EOS is going to die. The founder left. I don't know why it's even pumping here. He needs to, he needs to, like, he needs to take off my charts. I don't know. I got to research more about why he left and what's going on with that. Um, Algorand, Z Zilliqa. Um, I've never been too huge on Zilliqa. I know people were really, really hyped because it popped here. I was never that enthused about it. Like, sharding, dot does sharding, and a whole lot more. So, dot's my play in that space. Like, so dot, dot and Zilliqa or Zilliqa are competitors. Dot's way better. It's just that simple. Um, but they do the same. They do similar things. All right. Can you make a video about ETH mining at home? I have. I've already made a, well, not ETH mining. I made a uh, mining video if you haven't seen it, um, to how to get started. But that's that's using nice hash. Yeah, so um, ethminer.org. Ethminer. I think it's .org or something like that. If you want to get started right here, ethminer.org. This is the easiest software to run on your computer. You can run this on your computer, or you can have a, it, they've got a Linux uh, instance of it. You can run run on a Linux box or whatever. Um, but yeah, if you just want to run this right here and join their pool, um, this, this is this is what you want to do. You want to join a mining pool. And it's really simple. Just download and install the software on your computer. If you've got a GPU or you have a dedicated mining rig, um, uh, and you can just join the pool and off you go. So this is where I would go. 
Um, I don't think I need to make a whole video about it because there's a whole bunch of, uh, you know, maybe I could do a walkthrough on this sp specifically on ETH mining. It's, it's really not complicated if you just follow. Start here. This is a good place to start. Okay. Love Ada, by the way. Okay, cool. Like silver being poor man's gold. Uh, just because Litecoin's available on PayPal, yeah, I don't... Look, man, I'm telling you, I've been saying it for forever. <laughs> Litecoin's a relic of the past. Like, let's look at the let's look at the top. Um, Matic is one of the scaling solutions. Loopring. Uh, Alan asked me about Loopring earlier, which I had researched a while back. Actually, Loopring, and I thought it had died, but I just now realized Loopring is bigger by market cap than Matic is. I didn't know that. I thought I thought it was the other way around. So Loopring is another scaling solution y'all guys can look at if y'all want to look at. But this is a, an older one, ZK Rollup style. I don't want to get into tech stuff. All right. Um, where's Litecoin at now? See, Litecoin's falling. Like Litecoin's down 20%, while Polkadot's up 42%, Chainlink's up 25%, Cardano's even. Litecoin's a relic of the past, guys. Don't get caught up thinking that just because something pumped last cycle, it's going to pump this cycle. People are going to figure out and learn, like, the difference. So let's let's go back to what is the market potential for these different projects. Yeah, uh, do I recommend mining ETH? Mm. I don't recommend getting started right now, especially trying to build a new rig. If you have hardware, sure, yeah, I'm, I'm still mining. It's super profitable right now, but GPUs are like sold out everywhere. It's it's uh, very hard to find hardware right now, so I wouldn't recommend getting into it, starting it, especially building a rig right now. It'd be way too expensive. I'd wait till the next bear market. Uh, maybe maybe this time next year will be a great time to get into it. Hey, oh, nice welcome, watching from work. Watching this in line at Trader Joe's, awesome. Oh, you got a five five eighty? Cool. Hey, that's a great way to get started, though. You know, get get a, get one or two GPUs and learn, and then you can scale up um, in the bear market. Now that you're kind of cued in what's going on, let's talk about market potential. Let's just go to the list. Bitcoin either is going to be gold 2.0, and gold's market cap is what nine trillion. So from here, we can over 10x, right, to get to gold's gold's market cap. If if Bitcoin is nothing but gold 2.0, if Bitcoin becomes a new global reserve currency then you know we're talking multi-trillion dollars market cap so i mean uh way bigger than 10 trillion like 100 500 trillion or so, I, I forget the numbers right way way bigger right um so if bitcoin becomes a new global reserve currency at some point in the future it's going to have the biggest market cap of all cryptos because just like the us dollar just got a bigger bigger market cap than anything else but if Bitcoin gets not gets gets relegated to just gold 2.0. It's just a hedge, and it's just gold 2.0, which is great, you know, for us involved right now. It's still a massive, massive gain, right? It's like five hundred thousand dollar Bitcoin or something. Ethereum is a platform that you can that has changed. So, you know, there's this there's disruption. You can disrupt an industry and, and maybe um, maybe take some market share. There's innovation. Uh, if you innovate and really re, in, uh, you know change an entire industry you can take over and become the dominant player tesla is kind of the innovation in the car space right and then there's changing the world which spacex is like changing the world right so that's a good analogy so there's like changing the world type technology so facebook the iphone those are changing the world technologies ethereum is a changing the world technology bitcoin is too obviously that's that so you go without saying it's already there it's, we're beyond that bitcoin has changed the world but ethereum was the next iteration of changing the world that, that Bitcoin started, right? Bitcoin is, Ethereum is changing the world because not only do we have a, a people's money, a digital currency for the internet that doesn't get deflated away, um, that you can store value with, but we can write programs on this new, and so now we can change everything about how a lot of uh, legacy industries work. And DeFi is a good example, but Ethereum is not, you know, it, you can do a lot more than just DeFi with Ethereum. So Ethereum is a platform onto which you can do almost anything, right? And so it's changing the world. And so if you look at, like the S&P 500 has a bigger market cap than just gold. And Ethereum is not bound to just the US. Ethereum is a platform onto which, or the Russell 2K, I mean the Russell Plus, like, uh, the S&P 500 is way bigger than gold. Ethereum is a global platform onto which the new world economy could literally run. So if Ethereum reaches its full potential, it could it could easily surpass, and greatly so, that of Bitcoin. 
but it has to maintain its network effect and be the absolute dominant player in that space. I don't know if that's going to happen, right? I think I think at the end of, end of, end of it all, you're going to have uh, a several main platforms and then a bunch of smaller platforms. So I think you know Ethereum, Cardano, and two or three others are going to be the major platforms. Polkadot's going to be a, a major player probably for a long time because new smaller projects can get started on Polkadot. And I think all the new hot projects are going to be running on Polkadot. So that's what gives Polkadot this huge upside because it's like, it's like Ethereum for new projects, basically. It's, it's a better, it's a better, well, it's for new blockchains, like entirely new protocols and things. So Polkadot's changing the game. The reason I like Cardano so much for this market cycle is uh, they are aggressively going after underserved areas, namely Africa, and they're changing the world, right? They're, they're, they're foc- the goal is to change the world by being the first really scalable blockchain onto which underserved markets that don't have good financial services can build a whole new system. And so if they're able to, and, and they're going to beat Ethereum, right? They're going to be uh, up and running and scalable long before Ethereum 2.0 is. And while Ethereum A is also having to go through all the pain of doing that, and so there's going to be, um, Ethereum's going to be under pressure while Cardano's ramping up. So you've got that whole uh, uh, thing going on there. So, you know, Cardano, Polkadot, and then uh, Chainlink being the, the gateway. Right now it's the main Oracle system that there is, right? And these Oracle services are incredibly valuable. That is, you know, if the blockchain world explodes and Ethereum gets humongous, the ability to get information in and out of this blockchain world to the legacy world efficiently and trust trust is the most important part of this that's why chain link is that's why oracles are a thing um it's really really hard for blockchain developers to go and and to be able to pull data from the outside world in a it, that in, in a verifiable trust you know trustless way basically i don't have to if a, if a blockchain developer is pulling stats from espn for betting services you, you're, you're relying on trusting on ESPN ultimately. You're not, uh, so there's a trust thing there. So we have to trust the source of that data. Chainlink gives us a way to, through the way that the governance on Chainlink happens, to be a trustless, verifiable source of information, right? So I don't have to trust any one entity um, because of the way that it's a decentralized network. I'm trusting the decentralized network of Chainlink not a central uh, location like, say, an ESPN for data feeds or the, the Associated Press or whatever else. So those all have huge, huge potential. Uh, Stellar um, got big, has big potential too, but not, not cross-border settlements is going to be built into these other projects soon, so it's not a big deal. All right, moving on. Go back to questions here. When does 2.0 come out? So 2.0 has started. No, Ethereum 2.0 is absolutely not a gimmick. It's a real thing, and it's going to be a huge game changer. It started in December. Uh, the uh, contract for being able to put uh, to, to stake Ether on um, or to transition Ether uh, and lock it up on ETH 2.0 started early December. The protocol will probably be fully rolled out. If you watch, I have a video on ETH 2.0 oversimplified. I encourage you to check that out because it will explain everything. But very simply, the final stage is to take the current proof of work network that we're on now and merge it to the ethereum 2.0 network so the ethereum 2.0 network will not be able to run smart contracts which will, so basically to be useless while it while it's being developed until the proof of work network that we have today gets merged into it and converted to a proof of, of stake network and then smart contracts will be available on the new ethereum 2.0 network and all the legacy all the transaction history the, the full blockchain of transaction history and ethereum will also be moved over at that point then Ethereum 2.0 will be fully live. Uh, I would expect that no earlier than late 2022, early 2023. So it's a, a ways out. So it's going to be a lot of development. This market cycle, though, Ethereum is still the network effect, and people are going to talk about it, and it's going to have huge upside. Next cycle, either Ethereum 2.0 is going to be successful, um, and it's going to continue to be the dominant player, or it's going to have problems, and Polkadot, Cardano could pass it up or... I doubt they'll pass it up, but they'll catch up to it, right? Very potentially. So we'll just see what happens. Um, Ethereum 2.0 is proof of stake, not work. Mining will not be on that system. Yes, exactly. I don't know. Did I miss a comment about that? Yes, there's no mining on Ethereum 2.0, but 2.0 won't be out until the end of 2022. So there's going to be a hybrid proof of work, proof of stake as we go along as well. So proof of work, 
um, will still be available. You'll have other coins. So even when Ethereum 2.0 goes fully live, like ETH, Ethereum Classic um, and Ravencoin and Monero, you can mine. It probably won't be very profitable for a very long period of time to mine once Ethereum 2.0 uh, is fully live, though, and we lose our, our proof of work um, network that we're on now. So this is also why I'm not big into mining right now. It's like, yeah, so I, I'm planning to basically exit mining um, sometime in this cycle completely and transition to running proof of, of stake uh, validator nodes, right? So uh, um, staking pools. So I'll be running in the next bear market. I'm going to wait for the bear market because I want to be able to trade my coins right now. But in the bear market, I'll be standing up an ETH 2.0 validator and staking node, uh, a Cardano one, um, you know, XLM, Polkadot, Probably uh, some, I'll be standing up some chain link um, Oracle validator nodes um, or data feed nodes, whatever the, I forget the name of them. So I'll, I'll be getting into that game probably, um, you know, this time next year. Would you buy Cardano versus ETH then as an investment for the next three, six months? I'd buy a little bit of both. I'd, I'd hedge my bets. Now, Cardano is probably the best hedge against Ethereum. If Ethereum starts to have problems, like if, if the gas fees get outrageous, and the scaling is outrageous, Cardano should be the biggest recipient of any issues to Ethereum. So Cardano is a great hedge against Ethereum. So I, I, I'm actually about evenly split right now, Cardano versus Ethereum. I have about the same of both. Actually, I have a trade on in Ethereum. I don't think I have an active trade on in Cardano. So technically I have more ETH, but that trade doesn't count. I mean, I'm actually holding roughly the same amount of ETH and, and Cardano. How long should it take for ETH to realize the potential versus ADA or DOT tall, if at all? To realize its potential? I don't understand that question. Um, please toggle dark mode on coin market cap. Oh, I'm sorry. How do I do that right here? Hey, look at that. I love dark mode everything. Let's go look at the charts. Let's look at some more chart action here. I'm going to get back to the charts for just a second. All right. Yeah, look at that, man. It's holding so far. It's consolidating. Like I said, I thought I was going to ping pong around in here, and sure enough, it is. ETH BTC, ADA BTC. So I said if we closed on the four hour, and we did, I didn't take that trade because I started the live stream, I was going to open a trade. So as soon as we get off of here, I'm going to get back into a trade on ADA because this ETH level, we closed above it, and we fell back below it. I guess I'll put up, I'll probably, I'll probably. Probably the eight hour and the twelve hour. Yeah, so I'm gonna put a trade on for if we take out that wick high right there. I will put a trade on to have a, another entry in ADA on my for my trades, just to share with you guys. Not financial advice. It's just my opinion, what I'm doing. My stop will be way out here. So I'll give it a couple. I'll give it two support levels and that trend line for any wick down action. It should it's wick down should be should be bought up long before we get down there. If it, they don't, we're going down further. Yeah, pretty simple. Evening, Alan. So Alan's on. He's a moderator. All right, Alan's here. If you want to, if you, if since, thanks since you're on, Alan, if you want to scroll through and answer some questions. Do you like physical precious metals or are you crypto only? I have bought some. I am physical precious metals, yes. Um, I have more silver than I do gold. I think silver is the better trade because of the industrial use case in silver. Uh, since, uh, and I, again, if, if I'm mistaken, please correct me, but I believe the silver supply is actually declining because of all the industrial use cases and with you know somebody asked about the biden administration earlier um you know if if their green projects are go and they start to really ramp up the whole green project initiative um solar panels use some silver um uh, there's lots of use cases for silver in the world so i think it's silver is actually silver is actually being reduced in supply whereas gold is increasing in supply um but I have both. I mean, I think they're both fine. Um, I bought some, I did buy some more bullion down here on this big sell off right here. I've bought some, I went and bought some physical bullion the other day. Not much because they don't have um, the place I buy from. It's called Texas Precious Metals. They don't have the Texas native gold coins, which are a little bit less expensive. So I bought some American Eagles. But um, I did buy some more gold just to have on hand. And silver is, so I, I think this, this little bit of sell off in gold's. I think gold's going to have a good future. But I do like having physical currency around. You know, if the internet, like, it's a far out thing, but it's not impossible, right? If the world were to be in such a terrible situation, if the internet was literally shut down, a power grid was offline or whatever, you know, whatever type of apocalyptic scenario you can imagine, having physical, like, 
having a USB, you know, or a, uh, not USB stick, but a, a you know, a wallet, a Trezor or something with some Bitcoin on it, it's not going to buy me some gas at the, at the, uh, you know, at the store to be able to, to, or whatever I need, right? A loaf of bread, nobody's going to take a Trezor for a loaf of bread. I mean, I guess I could do like a, a paper wallet, but nobody's gonna care. Like, people are gonna want silver and gold if not possible. So, yes, I, I keep silver and gold, and I think they're good trades too. I mean, I think silver and gold's gonna be great trades this year. I, I said I think gold's going to three thousand. That's what I think. I think gold's going to three thousand, like in twenty twenty one. That's my opinion. Um, and silver. So let's look at let's look at silver real fast on the chart. Uh, what's its all time high? I, I think we 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 challenge if not take out the all time high this year in silver. It's $49. It's a long way to go. Yeah, I think we take out the all-time high in silver this year. Yep, so that's a really good trade. It's just my opinion. But I like it. Yep, thanks, Alan. I appreciate it. Do you ever sleep, Alan? Poor Alan. GRT is going to be good investment along, uh, good long, yeah. Um, the, so the graph is a unique way to share information, um, an indexing service. The thing about GRT, just to keep in mind, GRT was a centralized service. It was just a standard service before they made it a decentralized, you know, and had a, had a cryptocurrency for it. So um, it's not like a new thing. Just keep that in mind. So uh, I think it'll be potentially interesting, but it's not like it's a brand new thing. Another, here's another hot take for you guys. I know somebody, you know, people talk a lot about Litecoin. I, I, I said I think the top five cryptocurrencies coming out of 2021 are one Bitcoin, two Ethereum, three Cardano, four Chainlink, five Polkadot. Now, uh, Cardano, Chainlink, and Polkadot, if they were to move around, I wouldn't be shocked. I wouldn't be shocked if, Car if Polkadot was three, Cardano four. I would be shocked if Chainlink was three. That's the only one I'd be shocked by. Polkadot or Cardano being three. Um, I do think Chainlink ultimately is going to get a bigger pump when it's all said and done than Polkadot. Um, but I could be wrong. I mean, I... I could easily see it being one, two, and then polka dot three, could on four, chain link five. Um, anyway, um, nonetheless, um, what was I saying? I think that like VeChain, for example, which is down here at 20 something, 27, I think VeChain is gonna pass up Litecoin. That's at, at now, that Litecoin's at seven, at nine billion market cap, and VeChain's way the heck down here at a 1.5 billion dollar market cap. So there's a hot take for you guys. I think VeChain takes out Litecoin by the end of 2021. And the reason is it's a it's a blockchain. No, actually, Ave Ave could too. Heck, I'm you know I'm gonna go down the list and tell you which projects I think at the end of 2021 are gonna be ahead of Litecoin. We're just gonna do that right now for fun. And all these rap Bitcoin, none of this stuff like USD coin or Tether. Ignore that stuff. They should take that off the list. It's not a cryptocurrency project. Monero will be ahead of Litecoin. Ave will be ahead of Blockcoin, Litecoin. Synthetics will be ahead of Litecoin. VeChain will be ahead of Litecoin. Maker will be ahead of Litecoin. Celsius, probably not. It's a bit of a stretch. There you go. I got five projects that will be ahead of... I need to make a video. This needs to be a video now. Thank you. I just think I just thought of a video. Five projects that will be ahead of Litecoin by the end of 2021. Maker, VeChain, Synthetics, Ave, and Monero. There you go. You think I think I think of Litecoin. Alright, um Junk silver is the best for daily purposes. I totally agree. Yeah, so anything like pre-1974 junk silver bags are great. Can you take a look at GRT? Yeah, I can. Uh, GRT is cool. But I think the problem is GRT on, it's been beat down. That's the other problem with it. I keep talking about it, like, keep people bringing it up, but it's like just getting slammed. This is what I have. This is my Kraken feed, so maybe I'm, let's just go to a really low time frame because I have limited data on it. Um, yeah, yeah, was it trying to bottom out here? Maybe we got a little bit of a bottom here on like a four hour. We go to the eight hour at least. All right, what do we got? What do we got? We got support there, I'm trying to bottom out there. We've got a 
All right, you see that the um, close on the up wick the candle here, and then the open on that down candle there, and that touch right there, and that little bit of a touch right there, and then we got close to it there. There's where I would put the main resistance we got going on here in the short term. All right, let's go to the four hour to get some kind of local levels here. Let's look at some liquidity levels right there. All right, chair. Oh no, I want this thing. Right there. All right, so I think if you can hold that, close below that level, and we're just gonna ping pong down here a bit. Stay above that. Um, you know, we have a chance of resuming upward here. I wouldn't take a trade on this until we get above this level. Or my dog going crazy. Sorry about the noise in the background here. All right, get above this red line though. Before I care, it needs to get above this red line. I don't care until it gets above that red line. Simple as that. Now, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just bottom. It's, it's, it's doing, this is more important than any type of trend line up there. It's just this whole thing going on here. It's just bottoming bowl looking thing. We've seen it break out of here, All right? I'll just leave it simple as the horizontals are much more important than any sort of like trend lines. There's no valuable trend lines on here as far as I can see. So just get out of this area and it might be an interesting trade. Really, there's another obviously obvious level right through here somewhere. It might be a take profit. If you get above there, you might have a quick one-to-one -one trade. So you get up into here somewhere and take some profit and look for a resumption above that. That's, I don't know, I'm not too excited about the, looking at the chart. That's three percent of my portfolio. Awesome, Chief. Thoughts on Kusama? Uh, well, Kusama is just the, basically the test net for um, uh, polka dot. So Kusama's were like any pro so Kusama's the non-monetized version of polka dot, right? So it's like it's a very inexpensive, easy uh, to get access to. Yeah, like the pair getting getting on the dot polka dot network, the the pair chain, like um, to be able to 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 be. Um, to get a slot a parachain slot is difficult right now you have to basically it's like a like a competition to get a parachain slot so there's a couple of things like kusama network is good for if you want a very simple test you want to do some testing before you go live on the polka dot network start in kusama if you want a very simple cheap you don't want to pay for all the expense of being on the polka dot network starting you go to kusama um, and kusama is also going to front run dot as far as technology so the newest the latest greatest technology is on kusama versus dot however kusama's not the thing to be trading because it's, it's the non-monetized version. It's the open source version of the Polkadot network, basically. I mean, uh, like, you know, so Polkadot's where you want to be um, for trading, for investing, for long term. You know, Kasama's maybe you can watch the, the charts and maybe take a trade. It, it might, you know, it might lag Polkadot. Maybe Polkadot's a leading indicator for Kasama, but, you know, Kasama's not in, in, in and of itself super interesting. Polkadot's the, the play. What do you think about today's tether case? Speaking of, I haven't. I need to read up on it. I don't want to comment on the tether thing because I wonder if there's something I'm missing. Because I think it's just fud. <laughs> well, everything I said, I'm like this is just fud. What people are just making the same argument for like last four years. But let me read up on what the newest news is, and before I comment any more than it feels to me like fud because I've been hearing this for years. Uniswap will be ahead of Litecoin, maybe. I think it should. I think Uni uh, should be. Um, probably where is Uniswap? Oh, it's down here. Yeah, yeah. Fair enough. That's six. Yeah, I would think so. I think I think Litecoin's going to drop more than Uniswap's going to pump. But yeah, I think you're right. When you look at these decentralized exchanges, though, we talk about market potential, right? So Ethereum has the market potential of like the Russell plus the S and P five hundred and the whatever the uh, what's the European, the, the British, you know, whatever, FTE, or the FTSE, they call it, or whatever over there, and then the Chinese, it's got, like, the market potential of, you know, like the, it's, a, it's a monster market potential, because it's a whole new category, and you can build the new, like, you know, this is, this is the platform that the new version of Amazon and Google would built on, let's put it that way, like, that's how insane upside Ethereum has. Polkadot is is a uh, a incubator for all kinds of crypto projects, and it can be absolutely monstrously big. Cardano is the main competitor to Ethereum. If Ethereum were to falter, Cardano could be absolutely 
you know, world breaking huge, right? Um, Litecoin is just another coin that's inferior to Bitcoin. Like it has no real purpose in the world. Um, but if you look at what was the project I was looking at, so Polka, yeah, so Uniswap, Uniswap is an exchange. What, what, how big are the exchanges today? Like, how big is like Fidelity uh, versus, and, and Fidelity is a lot, lot more than just exchange, right? They do, they have other stuff. So, how big is just the exchange portion of like Robinhood, Fidelity, all these exchanges versus Amazon, Google, Facebook? Tesla, they're nothing, right? They're nothing compared to these mega tech titans. So Uniswap doesn't have, like, it. in the grand scheme of things, Uniswap is nothing compared to Ethereum, Polkadot, Cardano, Chainlink. It is nothing. It is insignificant nothing. But for the sake of this, this, this bull market cycle and all the crypto hype, it could get definitely a pump and get hyped. So just keep that in mind. The upside of these, like, exchanges, it's... It's not like that big. <laughs> uh, out of crypto question. Is it worth upgrading the TradeView Premium for the 8-hour chart or is 4-hour good enough? Um, is a 12-hour chart available without it? I mean, the premium's, yeah, the premium's worth it. It's super cheap. If if you're staring at charts all day like I am, like I'm flipping between charts whenever I have free minute, I go take a look at the charts. It's absolutely worth it, I think. But yeah, I haven't... I don't know. I, it's been so long since I've used the free version of TradingView. I mean, I've paid for TradingView for at least what, three years, four years, or something. I don't even know. Two years, maybe. I've paid for it for so long. I don't. I don't know what the free version, like, what the limits are. Um, for, for just the eight hour, I mean, uh, you know, if you don't have access to the eight hour or the twelve hour, then yes, it's an absolute essential. If you have the twelve hour and crypto, you can do fine just trading on the twelve hour. I don't know if you have the twelve hour though. So that would be my thoughts. Twelve hour. You can stick with the free. If you don't have 12 hour, you need you need 12 or 8 hour, one of the two. Which is safer? I have a lot of ETH and BTC investment. Which is safer for what? I'm sorry. Polkadot or Cardano, which is safer? Um, in the grand scheme of crypto projects, they're both safe. Uh, the safer bet would be to have a little bit of both. Polkadot and Cardano. That you would be better off. Because if Ethereum is wildly successful and if Cardano can be... I you know I think Cardano's not going to have too big of an issue rolling, but they have a tall task ahead of them of finish rolling out all the stuff that they have promised. So Cardano could run into problems, and it may not you know it end up breaching its market potential either. So Cardano is still, I mean it's not like a sure thing either, right? It's still a speculative um, um, buy. Polkadot is it's got the main nets out. They've got a lot of stuff. They they got a lot of stuff to roll out too. So they're both speculative buys, but. I think you'd be safer having a little bit of both than, than putting all your chips in one bet, one of those. This is why I won't sell ETH. Like, I've got ETH, Cardano, Polkadot, and Chainlink. Like, the basket of those things I feel good about. And Bitcoin's being the major one. ETH is 40% of my account. I don't trade cryptos, just buy as investments. Well, I think you're fine then. If thoughts on reserve token. I don't want to. I don't want to speak out of turn and make sure I understand which one we're talking about. Are you talking about RSV? Serve token. It's not. It's not coming to my aims to build stable decentralized asset backed crypto. I've heard of this, but I just I can't. It's not coming to me as to what. I have to read the tech. Before I make any recommendations on any protocol, I read the white paper, or at least skim through it to understand it. So if this is what you're talking about, if RSVs are what you're talking about, I haven't read enough on it to make uh, to comment on it. So until I get a chance to read their white paper or their tech papers, um, I, I won't comment on it. Is that what you But yeah, if you can validate for me, if you're talking about RSV, I will add it to my list to research. Any recommendations having beef eat BTC and ETH as the base of any crypto portfolio. Oh, Alan's recommending that. Yes, there you go. I was like, Alan, why are you asking me that? <laughs> you know my answer to that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, Alan's providing answers. Thank you, Alan. BTC is the best buy if you want less speculation. I agree. BTC is the trade. Don't, don't forget that. Never forget that. Anything else that we're doing is we're trying to beat Bitcoin because right now, Bitcoin is the trade. I, I think Ethereum's great. I think Cardano's great. I think Polkadot's great. I think Chainlink is great. But they're not the trade. 
poke be, uh, Bitcoin to trade. Can you please share with us your view on SNX long term? I got a bit bullish on them. I love SNX. Um, so it's, it's the synthetics derivatives that market. So uh, it's, it's basically synthetics builds, um, you know, derivatives that mimic real assets. And so when you look at it's a different I have it up here. I have it in red because I think synthetics is Matic. Loopring is the one that Alan, I don't know if you were on earlier when I said you brought up Loopring to me. And I looked at it a long time ago, and I didn't realize Loopring was bigger than Matic. Actually, I thought it was the other way around. So Loopring, Matic, um, those are like more direct sidechain scaling solutions for like payment systems. But synthetics is a different way of doing a scaling solution. It's it's through it's through derivatives. Um, and so I, I think can you look at here we talk about market potential, right? So the derivatives market today, what is so you know we've got like you've got your stock market, the equities stock market. You've got the currency markets, the foreign exchange markets. You've got smaller markets, and then you've got the derivatives markets. I forget the numbers, but you know the stock market is tiny compared to the exchange, the, the the currency market, the foreign exchange market, which is monstrously bigger. And then the derivatives market dwarfs both of those by a monster amount. The amount of hold on, how big is the derivatives? market. All right, let's just see if I can Google this for you guys real fast. Uh, there's a you know really good chart. I'm sure most of you have probably seen it. If you haven't seen this, you have got to see this and understand this. Yeah, here it is. This is a good one. Uh, what's the site? Uh, visualcapitalist.com. All right, so this is awesome. It's a great, great question. Thank you so much for the question about synthetics because I'm going to talk about this. Synthetics is the is the leader for the cryptocurrency derivatives market. Actually, if I go to pull up if I pull up DeFi Pulse, if I go to derivatives, you'll see Synthetics is the number one derivatives player with a 1.6 billion dollars of locked-in value. Right? It's on the Ethereum network, and then Nexus Mutual. All right. So, derivatives. When you look at the top end potential of these things, so this is the silver market. This little little box. It's the entire all of the silver on the planet Earth. This is the cryptocurrency market. It's grown a little bit since they probably did this visual. But Bitcoin is a little bit bigger than silver, right? And all the other coins, the so Bitcoin, Ethereum, and all the others. The U.S. government military spending or global military spending. I'm not sure which one, but you know, it's a, it's a, it's, the, the the governments spend a lot more money on killing other people than they than, than the cryptocurrency uh, market. Apparently, I don't know that. U.S. budget deficits way bigger than even the crypto market. Uh, coins uh, and banknotes, the Fed's balance sheet, which is like dwarfs cryptocurrency. Billionaires, gold. Here's gold. This is what Bitcoin will eventually probably catch up with. Bitcoin's got a long way to go to catch up with gold. Then you've got your Fortune 500, right? Market capitalization of all the big major players. It's pretty big. It's bigger than gold. This is why this right here is what this is. This is what. Ethereum could be, right, basically, right? This is the, the foundation on which all these big mega titans you see here. The big mega titans of the cryptocurrency landscape in the future could be built on Ethereum as, as the underlying platform. So Ethereum itself wouldn't be this big, but you get the idea. The entire stock market, really big. Lots of volume, lots of money involved in the stock market. And then here's the money supply. It's bigger than the stock market, I think, slightly. And then global debt is monstrously bigger. It's a bad problem. Real estate, really, really big. Global wealth, huge. And then here's the derivatives market, guys. All right, so if synthetics owns the, the, the derivatives market in the cryptocurrency space, and if cryptocurrency were to take over, uh, this is the derivatives market. It's still going, still going, still going, still going. Still, okay, finally at the bottom. The derivatives market, this is like, you know, contracts and... and um, options and whatever else, right? Um, now, it's not direct value. Derivatives aren't direct value, but you get the idea. Derivatives value market is, what they say here, something like, the notional value is $558 trillion. That's insane. So that's, you know, that's a, that's a big, big, big upside for derivatives. Right back. I get the sun right in my eyes. I'll be right back. All right, I'm already back. So let's go back to the questions here. So I hope that answers the synthetics upside is ridiculous. Um, now, obviously, it, it, it's not it, it's not it's not going to reach like the, the derivatives market cap of like the world. It, it's, but you get the idea. It's it's got some potential. All right. A little more info on Graph versus Chainlink. So. Um, Again, Graph is an indexing service, and it can be used for inter 
cryptocurrencies as well as outside. The problem with the graph versus like an Oracle service like Chainlink is, um, so API3 is another one of these Oracle services. That's a different way of doing the Oracle services. So graph API3 are in that bucket of challengers to um, um, Chainlink. The way the Chainlink ecosystem works is it's it's a lot easier to be able to pull data from the Chainlink network and know that you've got trustless, verifiable information. So I don't have to trust any central authority and I can verify the information. Graph and API 3 have a long ways to go to reach that that fully trustless model to be able to go, okay, I, I, if I pull the data from here, I know that this is uh, a, you know trustless, verifiable data. Um, on the on the decentralized network because again graph was a was a centralized service that just went decentralized but just just launched like a decentralized version of it so for me it has a long way to go so if you look at what they could this is why i say graph and api api3 is one of my deep sleepers i think that these 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 alternative ways of doing oracle like the web api3 is a web3 variant of like um, um you know an oracle service i think they could have huge market potential but Chainlink is like today, if you're going to build a project and you need to, to be able to pull you know, data from an Oracle service, Chainlink is where you're going to go. So for this market cycle, I think Chainlink has more upside because that's what's going to be used today. Just like Ethereum, I think, has more upside than a lot than a lot of the projects still to go, even though it's the, it's the leader because the market effect. So you've got the network effect uh, going on with Chainlink already. You've got the network effect with Ethereum. Over time, the graph or API 3, um, maybe at the end, maybe at the second half of this market cycle or um, next market cycle, they could be monstrously huge. But for right in the next three months, like what I'm really focused on is playing this next three months of the early phase of the altcoin um, cycle. And then so an alt season, the early phase of alt season. And so right now, all of the hype is going to go to the things that are provable and work, I think. And you might get some nice spikes out of like graph and, and we'll play them. We'll watch them on the charts. But graph has got to get, you know, more exciting. Look, look at graph. So this is what the market, the market's speaking right now. Look at graph and look at chain link, right? There's a spike here. Let's look at chain link on the USD and the graph on USD. But the market's speaking, right? The market likes chain link. It's got the network effect and it's the leader in the Oracle space. Let's look at GRT. The GRT rates graph versus like Tether is not a uh, USD. All right, head graph versus USD. Yeah, that's not looking good. So, you know, the market's telling me that Link is the play right now. So that's fundamentally what it boils down to. I've got API 3 down here too. So API 3 versus Ethereum. Yeah, see, API 3 is just sideways. So the market is telling me that. They, these are not the Oracle projects to be getting into right now because the charts just aren't setting up and Link is. And that's, that's a real simple answer. Um, but, you know, it's got network effect too, so don't, don't discount that. What's that website, Brandon? Oh, what was that? Uh, this one? Uh, oh, you guys can't see my link. I'm sorry. Let me, uh, I'll put it in here. I'll put, I'll put a link to in chat and I'll try to put it up make sure to put it in the video to credit them so there's the uh, link to that visual that I just used about the synthetics all the different markets it's called uh, it's visualcapitalist.com and it's like forward slash all the world's money markets in one visualization 2020 it's a big link so just I put it in the chat just now I hope that answers the question about graph and, and like API 3 and these other projects I mean it's we have to follow the the market will tell us you know tell us what where we should go and what we should do, and so ha half of my analysis is making I make sure that I'm comfortable with the technology and I like the technology and it has merit and then then I watch the market to tell me what to do right so I don't buy things just just because I like the technology because if the market doesn't agree with me it doesn't matter like if my opinion about it doesn't matter it's what it's what the market likes what the market thinks is important. Now, of course, I might buy a very small amount of some speculative thing that, that I think the market will catch up on eventually, but I'm not going to put any sizable investment in it. Like API 3, it's on my sleepers list. I think I have like a like one ETH worth of API 3, not even that. Like, like I don't, It's a tiny, 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 tiny little bitty bit of something that I'm holding on to because the, mar the, the, the chart's not set up. It's not... This is USDT, too. This is not even... Yeah, I mean, versus Bitcoin and everything, it's not doing well. All right, you guys get the point. I'm going to get off that topic. I think I'll turn my XRP into a synthetic token.
that's probably fair. Bond market's by far the biggest. Yeah, bond market's huge. I think derivatives is still bigger than the bond markets, though. Pretty sure. Or are bonds considered a part of derivatives? I wouldn't think that bonds would be derivatives, right? Wouldn't that be global debt? I think I think bonds would count as debt. Because you have to pay that back. So, yeah, government debt, I think, would be probably predominantly bonds. Somebody tell me if I'm wrong, but I think I think in this in this graph, uh, bonds would fall under global debt. All right. Um, what do you think about deflation tokens like Statera? Um, you know, I don't. I don't. I think it's overhyped. The deflation thing, I think, is overhyped. Like, I, you know, I don't. I, I don't really care if it has a controlled inflation or deflation as long as it has huge potential, the market's interested. I prefer fixed cap. Another reason I like Cardano, for example. Cardano, it's we, A, everybody knows exactly how much circulating supply is, whereas Ethereum, that's not the case. Ethereum doesn't have a hard cap, and Cardano has a hard cap, so we know exactly how many Cardano there, or ADA tokens are ever going to be, and it's going to get capped, whereas Ethereum doesn't have a cap. So, you know, all else being equal, I prefer capped or deflationary to inflationary assets, if, if, if that's a fair way of putting it. But it's it's a it's a side decision for me. Like I still hold lots of Ethereum, even though it doesn't have a hard cap, and we don't even actually know exactly how much Ethereum there is. Because frankly, I'm following the charts, and it doesn't matter. You know, if Ethereum goes from one thousand to five thousand in a few months, one thousand to three thousand in a few months, it doesn't matter if there's a supply cap. The it moved from a thousand to three thousand. <laughs> that's, that's what matters. I'm thinking it's a good question, though. I, a good question. I just I'm not a big like it didn't matter to me too much. I think derivatives market has a big element of double counting. So, yeah, yeah, of course, Ron. It, it, derivatives is not it's not actual value, right? You have to be able to execute that value. So it's but it's the idea is that there's a lot of of value tied up in the derivatives market, nonetheless. Oh, there's pop-up ads in TradingView? Oh, yeah. Forget that nonsense. I didn't know there were pop-up ads in free TradingView. Like I said, it's been years since I've had free TradingView. I have no clue. I'd suggest holding BTC to reserve assets. Other assets may wish to actually trade. Yep. I agree, Alan. Bonds are debt. Yeah, thank you. Um, How do you educate, train yourself on crypto, Brandon? You sound very knowledgeable and refer to Jordan's method as a prop, proponent. What does that mean? Um, so I use a bunch of different things to train myself. Like, so um, YouTube channels. Um, some of my favorite YouTubers are, let me just, I'll just, uh, I've got some really good favorite YouTubers. Uh, the Coin Bureau guy at the Coin Bureau and Hoshoshi. Hoshoshi's probably my favorite just because he's so technical. He's a, he's a theorem developer, does really good videos. Um, so Hoshoshi, um, Coin Bureau, um, and then, so I watch their videos. I, there's a bunch of other YouTubers that I'm not as enamored with. They're more hype guys. Uh, so I, I, I like the guys that are more straight tech for just getting information. Um, I'm pretty frequently checking out Coin Market Cap and just scrolling through here and seeing stuff that's up. Like I do this a lot. I just go, okay, what's up in the last seven days? Why is it up? I go read about it. Is it something I'm interested in, or does it just feel like a pump and dump? Right. So I, I do that a lot. Just Coin Market Cap. Take a look at the, like, what is this hedge trading thing? I don't know anything about it. Uh, it's up a lot. I'll go skim through here and see. You know, this is a platform where the traders can share their knowledge. Blah blah. blah. Yeah. Okay. Whatever, it sounds interesting. What's the market cap? I don't think I'm too interested in something like that. But, you know, whatever. So I just go down the list. Uh, so the way, um, there's a couple of good crypto websites. Um, and out of necessity, there's just times that I wanted to mine Bitcoin or mine Ethereum or whatever, and I had to go read up on them and learn them what they are and started diving into them. And I'm just a technology person anyway, so I just, I'm uh, curious about technology, so. Fundamentally, if I look at a project, I will go look at their website, find their technical papers, and skim through their technical papers. And because I've been around, I've been working in technology my whole career, I can pretty, I can very quickly figure out if it's BS or if it's real. Like that's ultimately what I do is I go look at a project's technical papers and I go, okay, this is a bunch of BS. Or hey, look, this has really got merit. That's, and that, and I only recommend projects to you guys after I've read the technical papers. I'm like, yeah, this has got real merit. It's it's got real potential. I can, and I can see both the market potential that we talked about today 
and the technical, like I think the technical merits line up with the market potential. Do you have a target for the next three months for ADA? Um, uh, what did I have in mind? Roughly, I had in mind like a dollar, maybe dollar forty. Yeah, I think I can see us spiking up to like uh, probably hitting resistance and, and consolidating below the prior all-time high before breaking out in the later part of the. Yeah, so dollar forty probably fair. Uh, I, I will be looking to exit Cardano, uh, at least shaving a portion of it. I'm going to hold some of mine even through the bear market for my uh, staking node once the bear market's over. So I'll continue to, so I have a private staking node, um, and I'll keep I'll keep my uh, ADA on my private staking node just to hold it even through the bear market um, before I turn that staking node pri uh, public. But um, I'll, I'll shave a good portion of my ADA right around 3 to $5 if we get up there. Um, again, we'll just watch the charts, right? If it just keeps spiking and moving, I might just hold. We'll just see what happens. But a dollar forty, I could see us definitely topping out there. We'll see. Don't know. Uh, but yeah, when Gogan goes live here in a couple of uh, weeks, um, this this thing's gonna get. I, I think Cardano's gonna get absolutely ridiculous. But if it doesn't, it doesn't. I'm staking it. I'm way up on it, so I'm I'm happy. But um, I I think a dollar forty is. is is possible. Yeah, we lived in Jordan's basement. We're exactly right. And, and Heath, too. Um, we all lived in Jordan's basement and just learned. Um, and Heath taught Heath taught me and Alan all about, about uh, liquidity and everything, too. I wish. That'd be awesome. I could live in Jordan's basement for six months and learn from Heath and Alan. <laughs> That'd be amazing. All right. Um, do you have a target for the next three months for Ada? Hey, Yep, going to be practical. Can you go over the ADA chart? Yeah, ADA BTC. So I do have, I'm looking to put a trade on again, back above this. I took profit as we fell back below, and I've been out of ADA on a trade uh, since we fell back below. I took, I've taken a couple trades. They've all been, I think I've taken three profitable trades on ADA. I don't think I've eaten a stop loss on ADA, which is nice. I don't really, I might have one losing trade. I don't know, it doesn't really matter. I had that bottom fishing trade. Oh, I did take that. I did take a loss when I was trying to bottom fish over here, right? So initially I had a loss. Took another one. Nice. I took profit into this resistance. That was a great trade. I took another trade somewhere in here. Either got stopped at break even, and then I just took another trade, uh, and I was out for profit as we fell back below here somewhere. I don't remember. But I'm looking to get another trade on as we break out of this. So back to the lower time frames. I had. I said if we close above that ETH level, I might be into a trade. We, I think we might, did we close above it on the four hour we did, not on the eight hour or the 12 hour. We get back above this top wick, I might get on a, a momentum trade back in here, a pseudo CTM trade. I mean, yeah, th this, if you count this as your breakout, your retest of that trend line and this horizontal support, um, at this point, I'd wait for the wick, I'd wait for the top of the wick uh, because of this level we got here that I've been watching before you get back in the momentum trade, taking out the bodies of these you've got that immediate resistance right there. So I'd wait till we get above this resistance, take out the top of this wick, and then you might be on a, a good trade set up for a move from here to here, and then watch what happens when we come into that resistance. Um, that's my opinion. That's A to BTC, A to USD. It's about to break out. It's about to go bananas. <laughs> that's, that is good looking consolidation right there on a daily, oh my word. I haven't looked at this, I have not looked at this. Oh yeah, that's about to fly. No, Cardano's about to fly. That's all I gotta say about that. It's gonna move. Next leg up should be a lot bigger than the last leg up on all these altcoins. So, um, yeah, we're getting all these little pops and these little leg ups here. The next leg up is gonna be bigger than the prior leg ups, most likely, more likely than not. As we're as we're you know starting to break out here, you gotta break the will of anybody who's trying to play to the side of that market. Do you see engine coin going 100x? Uh, yeah, I do. Are you concerned about any? I love engine coin. Are you concerned about any government intervention that might turn, uh, uh, might hurt or legitimize crypto? Miami Mayor was talking about BC Treasury mentioned regulations as a concern. Um, if it did, it would be short term. And no, I'm not worried about it for this market cycle. I think they got bigger fish to fry. They've got a global economic meltdown on their hands. They're not worried about Bitcoin right now. Bitcoin's tiny. It doesn't matter to them. So I think it's a fly to them right now. 
Raul Paul says bigger players are coming to crypto only after regulation is taking place. What is our biggest risk as crypto holders? Yeah, and I agree. Actually, regulation is only a good thing because the more regulation gets rolled out, the less fear there is about what the regula- how bad the regulation could be. Inevitably, the regulation probably isn't going to be nearly as bad as people think it's going to be. And so right now, frankly, in all the crypto markets, um, there's a lot of speculation, a lot of hype. But in Bitcoin specifically, a lot of that regulation FUD's priced in. You know, and when... Um, but yeah, there's a lot of these other projects. Like what happened to XRP is holding down a ton of these projects. Uh, and so when people realize, like ETH, you know, ETH, if you want to be safe, ETH has been cleared by the SEC. It's not a security. It's, a, it's, it's sufficiently decentralized. So, you know, you don't really have much to worry about there. Um, but yeah, I mean, there could always be something unexpected, sure. But I, I think it'd be short term. How do you trade BTC alt pairs during this phase? How would you trade them? Well, I, I've done a ton of videos on them, and I think we're getting long in the tooth on the session today. So, oh my goodness, it's been an hour and a half. Yeah, I need to probably start wrapping up here soon. Um, I just did a video on the alt season, and I talk a lot about the trade setups. And it's all CTM methodology. So I think fundamentally, if you join Jordan Lindsay's uh, session in the morning, I'll put it his channel. Hold on. Let's get, let's get uh, Conquer Trading and Investing. Conquer Trading and Investing. You need to join... Jordan's sessions in the morning uh, of, you know joining his session how do I share his channel specifically share the, not the video the channel let's go to his channel there we go all right um, I thought he had like a CTM tell me if this link works guys I will put it in chat real fast you need to be on his live streams to learn how to trade fundamentally um, and then I've done a bunch of videos on it so I'm just gonna leave it at that on INJ? No, I don't have any thoughts on INJ. ENJ I like. INJ I don't know, I don't know if I know anything about it. Ren and SNX, those are those are okay. Uh, I'm new to altcoins and have some SNX and Ren. What are some good addition entry points? We're getting a little long on the session today, so I think um, a lot of these other projects, I'll take notes and maybe we'll pick those up next time. I did want to get through the technology, the Ethereum te- uh, technology stuff, which we did. Um, I wanted to talk about why I'm not as bullish. So, uh, another th- yeah, Theta, I was talking about that earlier. You know, uh, the way crypto and blockchain works today and the de- any decentralized protocol like that is just not very efficient for any com- like any storage or compute resource intensive projects. So, um, I don't see those as my my. I'm getting warnings on my bit rates. I'm getting low for some reason. What's your favorite platform to trade alts on? So my favorite's Binance, but because Binance US is becoming um, an issue with uh, like for Texas specifically, I don't have access to Binance US yet. I have the le- I have an old grandfathered account on Binance. I've moved to Kraken. Kraken's okay. Kraken's uh, obviously improved a lot. It used to be very dour. On, I didn't think I thought Kraken was junk, um, but they've made a ton of improvements since I've last looked at it. So uh, Kraken's what I'm using right now to trade. It's working out pretty well. I can actually do leverage trades. It's the only place I found that I can do leverage trades um, legally without doing some type of VPN or something. Um, so I've been using Gemini is my favorite for onboarding. So if you want to buy crypto with your U.S. dollars, I say Gemini is the best onboard, um, and then Kraken's the best trading platform for people in the states and if you have Binance US probably Binance US but uh, Gemini is great too but there's very limited coins uh, but so Binance is probably the best and somebody asked a question for Alan I think XRP SEC has to do with them issuing XRP to fund yeah exactly uh, the XRP SEC case is clearly because SRP is central uh, XRP was always centralized it was uh, not until recently was it actually more or less decentralized, right? So for the longest time, it was highly centralized, and they just would dump coins onto the market at will, and that's not legal. <laughs> it's as simple as that. Thanks, Craig. Forex is 300% chains, not 400%. Yeah, you're right. I'm sorry. Yes, yes, you're right. So appreciate that. Um, thank you, Dan. I like being corrected. I like I don't I don't have to be like Jordan says I don't have to be right either I don't I don't want to be right I want to be correct so if you if I say anything wrong if I'm wrong about anything technical I say if 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 I say you know this is looks like an interesting level it's a Heath level on chart and he's like no Brandon you're a moron here's the level I want to be corrected I want to be correct 
because I want to be correct, so I want to be corrected. So, uh, Dan, thank you so much for your comment, and I will duly note it, and I will try to make sure they don't make that mistake in the future. Appreciate it. Um, the Japanese government gave a statement to this. They saw XRP as a fine, you know, security, Japan security laws. Yeah, so, like, today, XRP is not centralized as, as much as it was, and, and they've I think they've been under pressure from the SEC for a couple of years. SEC's probably investigating them for a couple of years. So now they're not, their practices are much more, uh, they're, they're not doing all the shady stuff they were doing as much back then. Uh, viewers are going to experience buffering. All right, well, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. So you're not too scared. Good to know. Thanks, Brennan. Have a great, have a great weekend, Ian at. Jordan recommends to open accounts with different platforms simultaneously. So, yeah, the other thing is, too, is um, when it comes time for us to exit crypto, uh, I want to have a couple of methods to get um, to. So I will have funds spread across um, a couple of different exchanges. And I also use I've talked about a lot about Exodus. So my um, hot my hot wallet for my mobile devices is predominantly Exodus. Right. So I have a small amount of funds um, on, on in Exodus. But Exodus is the front end. Um, I will have some other front ends, but Exodus is the front end for a lot of my crypto assets that I have on my uh, uh, offline wallet. My where these things are. Um, sorry. Oh boy, I just messed up my desk while I was trying to look at something. Um, but so at Exodus with Exodus wallet, you can do. Um, you can exchange through the wallet and they use a, a basket of, of exchanges to the uh, decentralized exchanges, uh, non-custodial exchanges specifically to do that. Sorry, I had to pop mute, fix, fix something. Um, so Exodus is going to be another good way. Cause again, they have a basket of non-custodial exchanges that you can, you know, be able to exchange some assets as well. So I think having a multitude of, of methods to, uh, exchanges that you're on and a wallet that has access or you know metamask or uh you know ha having access to polka dot or whatever polka dot might be like not polka dot um um uniswap might be really bogged down about that time too but having a, a several methods to be able to exchange your your crypt main cryptos back into um stable coins is going to be a good idea you don't want to you don't want to be stuck on one exchange and it be down and Bitcoin tank 30% before you can get out, right? So you, you're gonna wanna, you're gonna want to make sure you have your funds uh, spread out. I would say. All right. Thanks so much for your time. Uh, thanks, Lizzie. Appreciate it. How do you guys store your crypto? Ledger got hacked. Uh, I'm a Trezor guy, so I've always had Trezors because uh, Trezors are open source software, whereas Ledgers are are uh, private software and. Um, I've had this question asked too, like all, weirdly, people think that because Ledger is private software, it's more secure, it's less secure. So when, when nobody else can see your code, the only people that can fix code problems are the people that write the code. Whereas an open source community, everybody can, can see the code and everybody can point out the flaws and it's a community effort to fix it. So um, this is why Linux is far more secure than Windows. This is why. Um, so, you know, I, I prefer open source to, to proprietary in pretty much all things technology, so uh, I've always been Trezor because of that. Um, I just bought a thousand engine. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I'm not suggesting people buy a ton of engine. I have a tiny, tiny amount. It's a fun project. I think it could 100x, yeah, absolutely, as it makes inroads more as some of the bigger uh, names in the video game space make use of, of that platform for in-game uh, content. And um, uh, non-custodial, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, non-fungible tokens and things like that. So should we have multiple wallets? Uh, well, that's up to you. I do. I absolutely have. I have more than one hardware wallet. <laughs> I have more than one mobile wallet. So I don't have just Exodus, by the way. I've got more, but I'm, we won't get into that. Um, and yes, thank you, Alan, for pointing that out. It, 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 the ledger hardware wallets did not get hacked. They're not, you're not exposed to anything. Their e-commerce site, which I believe was on Shopify, was it was hacked and they were able to get access to people's information. I did a video on security. I did, I did a video just on the ledger hack a little bit, but fundamentally, um, you know, they got access to people's private information 
which is really bad because everybody that was hacked, they all know they're alleged customers, so they can do very focused phishing attacks on on all the uh, credentials that were, you know, all the information that was stolen. So they can send you emails. They know that you're a Ledger customer, so they can try to send you emails that look a lot like it's something from Ledger and get you to divulge information you shouldn't divulge. Never put your seed phrase in your computer in any way, shape, form, or fashion unless you're restoring a wallet. <laughs> like, uh, but it, like if you get an email and they say we need your seed, don't like just, just be very careful with your seed phrase. This is that's that's the most one of the most important things to know about. Um, all right, enjoy your late night walk run. That's fun. Run DMC is going for a walk. Why don't you go for a run, run DMC? Uh, suggest instead of selling crypto, one should buy gold with it for not being subject to taxes. Really? If you buy gold, you're not subject to taxes? Oh, I did not know that. I thought it would still be a taxable event if you were to buy a commodity with a currency. Uh, or actually, uh, you're buying uh, crypto is mostly a, considered a property or a, a commodity. But if you buy, if you exchange one for the other, is it not taxable? Is it like a barter? I will look into that. I did not know that. That is awesome. Is that why everybody talks about moving to PAX Gold? I, am I just, I've been missing that. To, like, I'm not a tax expert, so you know. I, what I do is I pay tax people. I give them a list of my, here's my income, here's my deductions, and at the end of the year, I usually ask them if if my income's too much, what uh, what do I need to buy to get to the below whatever threshold I need to get below to get me a little bit of tax savings, and I go buy stuff that's tax write-offs. That's like what I do every year. <laughs> so at the end of this year, I'll, I'll probably probably buy a truck, an RV, some land, a bunch of computer equipment for for staking nodes next year, whatever I have to buy to get under under whatever I can to get what tax advantages I can. That's just how I do it. But if gold is not taxable, that is awesome. Thank you, Alan. I'd be happy with 10x. Yeah, exactly. Well, the, as the problem is, is that now, now the hackers have your private information, which is not good. It's not good that they got hacked, but you're not like going to, they're not going to, uh, you would have to give them more information for them to be able to um, get the, the money off of your hardware wallet, your ledger, to put it that way. You only report it or after you sell it with gold. You'll pay taxes on the sale of your crypto. Yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty sure any way you sell crypto, if you buy gold with crypto, I'm pretty sure it's still taxable. How can one buy precious metals with crypto via Coinbase? So there's that PAX Gold. I mean, so you're buying a gold-backed crypto. You know, it's not the same thing as buying physical gold, but um, PAX Gold. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, let's let's all do a little bit of tax rules very a lot depending where you live too. Yeah, it's a good point. It's best. I use a tax person. There you go. Go ask your tax people what's, if you can buy gold and not be and not not have to pay taxes on Bitcoin gains. You live in a great place. I don't, I'm not a tax person, smile, I have got no clue on any of that stuff. I pay tax people. Simple as that. I have tax people. I have accountants, tax people, help me set up business entities and taxes and so forth and so on. So I don't know any of that stuff. And I don't care. It's not my profession. It's not what I want to do. And this is why I'm like, all this, I don't I want to avoid a taxable event. I'm like, man, if I can make some trades and, and make more profit, I'm going to pay the whatever the tax is on that. Because, I mean, there is a calculation, right? If you're if you're making a bunch of moves to gain 10% and paying 30% taxes, but rarely is that that you're paying, you know, as you, as you accrue value, you're paying a percentage of that accrued value. So rarely is it the case that unless you're, unless you're waiting to sell, to be able to switch from income to capital gains, that's the only time I ever really ever pay attention to what I'm doing with buying and selling is if I'm like, all right, if I hold this thing for a little bit longer, it'll be cap gains. That's what I want. Capital gains uh, tax. That's what I want, but you know, at the end of the day, if selling something, uh, you know, waiting for it to drop fifty percent to avoid paying an extra twenty percent of my taxes and cap and in, in income versus or whatever it is, like capital gains is probably going to go up, right? That's the thing. Um, and capital gains after one year isn't that big of a discount. It's like after five years, it's a really big discount, from what I understand. So that's the only time I ever pay attention to that stuff. 
anyway, t t get 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 a, get a tax expert. Don't ask me. I don't know anything about this stuff. Um, I don't ever buy anything with Bitcoin because I'm always trying to collect Bitcoin. So no, I've never bought anything with Bitcoin that I can think of. No. All right, guys, I'm gonna wrap up here. We're really long in the tooth in this this one. I will try to carve this up into some. Um, and a few uh, broken up videos on the different topics that we discussed to make sure that everybody is able to uh, enjoy the content without having to watch the whole thing. And I'll try to put timestamps on here as well. Um, but thank you all for, for joining us today. Appreciate everybody and all the chat and interaction. It's been great. And Alan is British. <laughs>